Welcome to Scary Savannah and Beyond and episode number 89. We're quickly approaching number 100, aren't we? We're getting there quick. It's almost unbelievable that we've been doing this podcast for nearly 27 years. Well, technically, we have over 100 episodes. We just don't classify the police blotters as whole episodes, I guess. Yeah, we don't do that because that would be cheating. So I wonder how many we've done if we could factor that in. 27 years worth of episodes. I don't think so. (laughs) Give or take. Yeah, I don't think so. So how has your week been going? Um, it's involved a lot of basketball. Yes, it has. I just love this time of year. It's March Madness, so I'm watching like eight games at a time <laughs> until they narrow it down. Well, by watching it, you mean you're on the couch sleeping after that martini I made. And you. that was your fault. Well, I asked. You didn't have to say yes. Well, you offered me a martini. How am I going to say no? She isn't going to say no. It's like we sat down to watch one of those games and we had a martini. And then all of a sudden we both woke up. Mama's (laughs) family was on. (laughs) Yeah, Mama's family was on. I was like, what do you do to my basketball game? Which to me feels like a suitable exchange. You don't like basketball? I like basketball, but not as much as I love, love old Mama's family. Well, baseball season kicks off in just a few days. I think four days from now. I am excited about that. Yeah, by the time uh, this airs, it will be baseball season. Yeah, we have not been watching preseason because most of it you can't see on TV and the rest of it, it's it doesn't count because, yeah. I mean, the Braves have lost a few games and obviously that ain't going to happen in the real season. And they tie, which is weird. How is that possible? I don't know. I don't like it. It doesn't make sense. I don't like it. But you know what does make sense? What? The topic we're talking about this week of which I'm going to take a wild stab at and say it has something to do with Bigfoot. It might. So I've been threatening to do this episode for a while now, and I figured since big government has blown my cover and finally admitted that aliens are real, we might as well conclude that they've also been lying to us about our friend Bigfoot. If their mouths have been open, the lies have been coming out. (laughs) That's how I view it. I thought you were with big government. That doesn't mean that that's wrong. I've always thought that Bigfoot gets way too much attention. Most of the cryptids we talk about have a very small following, Like my favorite, the Slide Rock Bolter. We even have shirts with that on. We do. Most of them don't even have a drink named after them, but this is not the case for Bigfoot. A quick Google search will pull up hundreds of variations for a Sasquatch cocktail, such as this one. They have cocktails? They do. Oh, we're going to put the recipe up, I guess. We are. you got to have Rittenhouse Rye, Mm. Laird's Applejack Brandy. It's already too sweet for me. (laughs) Me too. Three droppers of Barkeep brand Apple Spice Bitters. Okay. And half an ounce of smoked brown sugar syrup. So that... Sweet. You put um, liquid smoke in that, which is weird. That does sound kind of interesting. Yeah. Uh, I mean, but that's 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 a cocktail. It sounds like a shot. No, it's a cocktail. And you serve it stirred over uh, ice with a cinnamon stick. Okay. Well, it sounds interesting. And you garnish it with fresh or dried slices of apple. It looks mm. pretty. Well, oh, yeah. That, I think I could take a sip of I it. I mean, I drink. Don't get me wrong. I mean, I drink yeah, it. It'd don't be way too sweet. I'd probably have stomach problems after, but. From my extensive knowledge of Bigfoot, which is not extensive at all, this sounds exactly like something he would enjoy after a long day of ripping trees out of the ground and throwing rocks at terrified campers, which are two of his favorite pastimes. It doesn't matter where in the world you go, almost every place has a version of Bigfoot, Sasquatch, Yeti, Abominable Snowman. Mm. I went on Amazon and just typed in Bigfoot, and there were hundreds of items from hats to shirts to shower curtains garden decor, even an emergency Bigfoot noisemaker, which features four distinct Bigfoot sounds, a howl, a snort, a roar, and a groan. So what would you need one of them for? I'm guessing its purpose is to scare off a Bigfoot if you think he's throwing rocks at your campsite, or possibly attract a Bigfoot if you're like me and want to finally capture that high-resolution photo of him. And of course, for the low, low price of $10.99, I had to buy one. You bought one? I did. Are you kidding me? <laughs> this is, I have not seen this. Yeah, you have not. Oh, this uh, is a surprise. Check this out. So let's see what this thing is all about. Okay, so it's got a howl. Okay, that's mildly annoying. And a snort. That sounds like Layla. It does sound like Layla. All right, a roar. And a groan. Okay, so my question is, (laughs) let's say you're trying to ward off a Bigfoot. What if you accidentally hit, like, the mating call? Uh, That's why that's not on there, I think. But how do you know that the groan is not the mating call? Well, I would just do the roar. (laughs) The roar might be the mating call. (laughs) All of them might be the mating call. Then I guess you're doomed at that point. Oh, $10.99. It's money well spent. It is. 
I also got you this cool hat, but I bought it before we started using a green screen. So hopefully it'll show up on camera yeah, and uh, not look like you have no top to your head. I just noticed that the Bigfoot toy is green. And that's too. why I was holding it in front of my shirt. Awesome. <laughs> you might oh, well, hold it up in front of your you shirt. You may not have seen it. You may have just seen a big hole in our backdrop. We'll but hey, we're still learning here. Well, we'll post, we'll a, post picture. a picture of it one way or another. So clearly from all the merchandise out there, Bigfoot's team is a marketing genius. I just wonder if he's getting a cut of all those sales. He better be getting his percentage. <laughs> he probably isn't. I set out researching the subject and wanted to answer some questions. So how did Bigfoot or Sasquatch become such a cultural phenomenon? Who gave him his famous moniker, Bigfoot? Is he real? And why does he smell so bad? And is he really a vegan? That's mm. really what got me interested in him in the first place. Well, when who I saw, proposed that he was a vegan? I remember I saw a bumper sticker a while back and it said, Oh, a bumper sticker. Bigfoot is vegan. Well, so, that does settle the argument in my eyes. Well, it really got me wondering. There's it, a lot more to him than I thought. He's a lot deeper so than just the smell. Let's just find out. Tales of this elusive creature date back thousands of years and were passed down orally or by pictures carved into rocks. These are called petroglyphs. They are. And they look like high quality art. Mm -hmm. Was it kindergartners back then did these things? <laughs> it may have been. <laughs> the name Sasquatch comes from an indigenous word, Sasquets, which means wild man or hairy man. Okay. We do have written accounts of the creature for hundreds of years now, but he didn't really have his breakout moment here in the U.S. until the 1950s when he was given the name Bigfoot and that name stuck. But let's get back to a little earlier in time and talk about the lore. I know how you love to delve into the lore. Some indigenous cultures describe Sasquatch as a shape-shifting creature. Easy for me to say. Ah, it is. Others use Alliteration. The, <laughs> others use the idea to scare their children from staying out late, warning them they would be carried off by these monsters. We hear that a lot with cryptids. Cryptids, yeah, a lot of these cautionary tale type creatures that they use for that purpose. The Iroquois people had a version they called the Stone Giant. He was described as a giant covered in hair with rock-hard skin. Now, who ever got close enough to find out how his skin felt? Probably the people that made this here Bigfoot call, I'm assuming. Because <laughs> how people. else would they know what it sounds like? And it's such a faithful reproduction, I'm sure. Other natives called them skookums and described a race of wild men who were cannibals that lived at the peak of Mount St. Helens. Theodore Roosevelt, who was our 26th president wrote a book called The Wilderness Hunter. In it, he relays a story told to him by an elderly mountain man. He told of a large creature who walked on two legs like a human. This creature was extremely smelly, which is a common trait. He claims that he was stalked by this creature and that it ransacked his beaver trapping camp and broke his friend's neck. Oh, wow. That escalated quickly. It did. Oh, oh goodness. I guess he didn't have one of these plastic... Bigfoot calls to he ward didn't. it off. You know, thank goodness technology exists. In 1840, a Protestant missionary named Reverend Elkanah Walker told stories of giants that lived in the mountains of Spokane, Washington. They were said to steal salmon from the fishing nets nearby. So this makes me question the whole vegan situation. Well, some vegans eat fish or some vegetarians or I don't I know. I don't think they do. Or is that Catholics? <laughs> I don't know. They say they ain't eat meat, and then they eat fish, and it's how is that not I meat? I think that's paleo or something. I don't think it's vegan. Well, whatever it is, it's probably confusing. The Oregonian published an article on July 6th, 1924, and told a story of a group of men who were prospecting for gold. They claimed they were attacked by a group of ape men in a cabin near Mount St. Helens. Fred Beck said he was able to shoot one of these creatures with his rifle. But that didn't stop them from bombarding their cabin with large rocks, which caused damage to the roof, and one rock knocked Beck unconscious. As soon as the sun came up, the men got the heck out of there. The U.S. Forest Service went to investigate the situation, but concluded there was no evidence that anything happened, which sounds exactly like something big government would say. Ah, uh, if you'd only seen the files that I have access to, I swear. To this day, the area is still referred to as Ape Canyon. Well, you know... When you read an account like that, and you see the president talking about it. Mm -hmm. um, it lends a little credence. You can't think that everybody's crazy. I yeah. mean, obviously, some, but something has to be going on. And we haven't even gotten into a lot of the details We have yet. not gotten into I already into... believe it wholeheartedly. <laughs> You're already concluding. Uh, well, I mean, Save I, have, it for the end. I have the files. But. A man named Rant Mullins would later claim in the 1930s that he and his fellow foresters carved large feet 
out of wood and then created footprints to scare huckleberry pickers. Those dadgum huckleberry pickers. He also took credit for the Ape Canyon hoax. I don't know what this group's motivation for the alleged hoax would have been other than to get their 15 minutes of fame, but they did start calling their little gang the St. Helen Apes and eventually had a cave dedicated in their honor. So there's that. So That's the winkest motorcycle club name I've ever heard. The winkest or the weakest? With them. <laughs> exactly. Weakest. Here's a photo from 1951. This photo was taken in the Himalayas by a British explorer named Eric Earl Shipton. He claimed this was an authentic photo of a Yeti footprint. The original photo sold at auction in 2014 for almost $5,000. What do you think about that? Do I think it's real? Mm-hmm. I think it looks abnormally symmetrical. You think? For something to be natural, don't he, you think? It looks wide, like uh, you'd wear wide shoes. Yeah, looking at it, I mean, it's just so perfectly rounded. Yeah, you, you could see just what I mean? easily cut that out, that, of the, that doesn't, out of the ice with your, like, with your hand. I'm not saying that <laughs> it's not Bigfoot. I'm just saying it just looks too symmetrical to me to be a real thing. Well, so I 100% believe it's real. <laughs> 100% believe it's real. Now let's get to 1958 when Bigfoot became a cultural phenomenon in America. Picture it. 1958, Humboldt County, California. Enter one Jerry Crew, a bulldozer operator for a logging company. Jerry is out and about doing whatever it is you do when you finish your shift as a bulldozer operator in a logging camp. I'm assuming it's drinking a lot of alcohol and plowing down random trees. That may have something to do with it. Mm -hmm. Jerry happened upon some rather large footprints in the mud. You might even call them big. Ooh, well, well, presumptuous of you there. Well, Jerry and his co-workers certainly did. He called up the Humboldt Times newspaper and spoke with a reporter named Andrew Genzoli. After interviewing the men, Genzoli wrote an article and introduced to the world to the name Bigfoot. Ah, so we got him got to the origin. think for it. All right, the lore came through. They claimed many strange things had been happening around their work site, such as an oil drum, which weighed 450 pounds, had been moved for no reason. That could go back to the drinking and driving the bulldozer, I'm just right, saying. Yeah, that's true. They made a plaster cast of one of the human-like feet that was said to measure 16 inches. Jerry posed with this plaster cast for the newspaper, and the story spread like wildfire, and a legend was born. I don't even think that's as big as Shaquille O'Neal's foot. <laughs> Isn't it? I don't think it is. Humboldt County and Willow Creek are still recognized as the Bigfoot capital of the world, and is home to the largest Bigfoot museum and plays host to the largest celebration each year, aptly called Bigfoot Days. So they got a parade and everything? They got a parade, do they? Museum? Okay. Everything. I got a big, important question. Mm -hmm. They have a bluegrass band festival. Oh, you know they have to. You got to be bluegrass. Because you know if Bigfoot listens to music, yeah. it's going to be the Foggy Bottom Boys. Yeah. It's going to be Doc Watson. Absolutely. It's going to be Andy Griffith. <laughs> Absolutely. I feel like he's really into Andy Griffith. It's probably his favorite TV show. Why wouldn't it be? It didn't take long for Bigfoot to take the nation by storm. Sightings multiplied all over the place. People became Bigfoot experts by compiling all the facts they could, and those brave enough set out to prove his existence once and for all. So that is going to bring us to probably the most famous Bigfoot sighting of all time, the infamous Patterson-Gimlin film. This has to be the one it is. that I'm thinking of. Has to be. Bigfoot enthusiast Roger Patterson. Patterson was a filmmaker who took interest in Bigfoot after reading an article in True Magazine in 1959. The article was written by Ivan Sanderson, the father of cryptozoology. I wonder if this is like the magazines that we talked about in a previous episode where the, what was it, the Thunderbird? Yeah, and, I think it was. And it something came like from that. like the men's magazines of mm -hmm. the 50s with the guy with, that was like ripped with the jeans on and the axe and being carried oh, away by it. Yeah. There's got to be a picture of some similar scene where they're at a picnic and the dude's got an axe <laughs> and he's fighting Bigfoot. I think that's exactly what he was reading. I certainly hope so. So in 1967, Roger Patterson was working on a pseudo-documentary about a group of cowboys searching for Bigfoot. Patterson, along with fellow filmmaker Robert Gimlin, set out to Northern California near Bluff Creek, which is a Bigfoot hotspot. So it's Friday, October 20th, 1967. You've got Patterson and Gimlin on horseback. It's around 1.15 in the afternoon when they, quote, came to an overturned tree with a large root system at a turn in the creek almost as high as a room. There was a log jam, a crow's nest left over from the flood of 1964. And this is when it happened. On the other side of the creek, they saw a creature. 
Gimlin recalled that he was in a mild state of shock. Their horses reared up when they sensed the creature. This is the camera that they had with them. Okay, high tech, very Uh high tech. Patterson dismounts his horse and pulls his camera from the saddlebag and captures what was described as, quote, a large, hairy, bipedal, ape-like figure with short, silvery brown or dark reddish brown or black hair (laughs) covering most of its body, including its prominent breasts. Sounds like a man, don't it? So it's a female. I noticed its prominent breasts, mostly. I didn't notice what color it was, (laughs) but I did notice It was red, maybe brown, black, black. I don't know. Could have been blonde. Might have been green. I'm not sure. (laughs) This creature is walking away from the camera with Patterson pursuing it. I didn't know it was a female. Yeah, I know. A lot of people don't know that. I had no idea. When he was about 80 feet away from it, that is when the creature turns and looks over its shoulder at the men. This is the iconic picture that everyone has seen. If you haven't seen the footage, it's easy to find online, but I think most people have seen it. So here is a still frame from the film, and this is frame 352. This is the one that literally everybody has seen, whether Mm -hmm. they know it or not. Patterson said the creature looked back at them a few times, all with a look of contempt or disgust. It's because they were looking at the prominent breasts. Is like, what it was. Come on, you skeezes. He likened it to, quote, when the umpire tells you one more word and you're out of the game. That's the way it felt. End oh, quote. I, I get that look. Man. Yeah. It's like, don't bother me. Don't follow <laughs> me. Patterson continued to pursue the creature until it disappeared into some trees. Just asking for it, I guess. So you've seen the film and the still frames. What do you think about this? Is this a legit Bigfoot encounter caught on camera? I think that I've seen people talk about it before and said that they have disproven this film before. I've also seen people say that they believe it's 100% accurate. Uh, Me personally, the one thing that I've heard about that they say that people have struggles with when they're trying to fake Bigfoot footage is the stride of a man Mm -hmm. or a human doesn't match that of like an ape or something of that nature. And it would be hard for a human to mimic the way one of these creatures walks. And so I've seen people say that this looks legit. They have tried to recreate it and could not. So I would say, I mean, I'm not saying a hundred percent sure that I think it's fake or real, but I would lean towards thinking it's maybe real. We're going to talk a little more about it. I don't know. I think it, I think it's been somewhere said that it's been disproven, but based on what I know at this moment, that's what I'll say. Well, as you can imagine, the film has been the subject of debates for decades. Some people think there's no way it could be a hoax, while others say there's no way it could be anything other than a hoax. Patterson had hopes that his film would once and for all prove the existence of Bigfoot, However, most scientists dismissed the footage. Patterson died in 1972 of cancer and went to his grave claiming the film was authentic. And just before he died, he said that he wished that he had shot the creature instead of videoing it. it. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, come on. That seems a little bit aggressive. Well, Patterson and Gimlin both agreed that that's what they should have done. Tried to shoot it. We got to prove it. Mm -hmm. Gimlin also claimed that the experience was real. And he's the other one. And he said that in 1999 in an interview, he said the only way is if Patterson faked it and he didn't know about it and it fooled him. So so he's kind of guy that wouldn't be as easy to pull the wool over the eyes as it would be, say, me. Well, I think it's 1967 and you're going into it expecting maybe to see it and then you see it and you wouldn't think the guy's tricking you, but maybe he did in retrospect, so... So why didn't they keep up with it? Did it outrun them? Or, I yeah, mean, it disappeared into the woods. Because it, it was, remember I said there was a, a, like a massive. Creek bed or something? Yeah, it was really far away. Okay, so they could, so they were zoomed in on it, which is why it's mm-hmm. so grainy, I guess. Mm-hmm. A man named Philip Morris came forward in 2002, claiming that he sold the costume used in the film to Patterson. Ah, plot twist. Morris runs Morris Costumes out of North Carolina. He says he sold Patterson an ape suit via mail order in 1967. He claims that Patterson asked him how he could make the shoulders more massive and the arms longer. Morris told him to put football shoulder pads under the suit and told him to hold sticks in his hands inside the suit. Okay. Morris said regarding the walk, quote, The Bigfoot researchers say that no human can walk the way in the film. Oh, yes, they can. When you're wearing long clown's feet, You can't place the ball of your foot down first. You have to put your foot down flat. Otherwise, you'll stumble. 
Another thing, when you put on the gorilla head, you can only turn your head maybe a quarter of the way. And to look behind you, you've got to turn your head and your shoulders and your hips. Plus, the shoulder pads in the suit are in the way of the jaw. That's why the Bigfoot turns and looks the way he does in the film. He has to twist his entire upper body, end quote. Okay. Clearly, he didn't know it was a woman. Okay, so he clearly missed the prominent breast. <laughs> he did. Clearly. Morris has no evidence to back up his claims, no bill of sale, no proof he had such a costume in 1967. So what would be his motive for saying it then, I wonder? Just the, be on TV and be, be on TV and be interviewed, I, I guess. Uh, draw Everybody. attention to my costume shop. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Publicity. Yeah, I got to sell me some Bigfoot costumes. We're running a special right now. Well, we've seen movies from the 60s with monkeys and ape type creatures, and they don't look anywhere near that good. Yeah, it looks very real to me. Yeah. They tried to recreate the film in 2004, but it was not similar. Morris claimed that he didn't have time to properly prepare for the recreation. It seems like by 2004, you could have created a suit to match the film you were able to do in 1967. I don't know. You only had 30, 40 years to do it. Well, we can't build the technology we (laughs) use to go to the moon anymore. So I don't know if we could a costume might be the same thing. I don't know. So if Morris says he sold the suit, who was supposedly wearing it? And that would be a man named Bob Hieronymus. Bob says he was hired to play the role of Bigfoot. He decided to come forward in 1999. He had kept quiet for all those years because he was hoping to get paid. Cash in on that Bigfoot money game. Uh Uh-huh. But that never happened. And he was also afraid he could get convicted of fraud for impersonating a Bigfoot. I was, well, you know, there's (laughs) some statutes in some some counties, yes. (laughs) We all know Bigfoot has a huge legal team and sues anyone who impersonates him or her. Very, very stringently keeps track of that. Several people say they did see a gorilla suit in Bob's car in 1967. Well, it was 1967. They <laughs> so all it wasn't unusual. Have, they might have been partaking of a few things before they stumbled into the back of his car. <laughs> the 1960s were the heyday for Bigfoot. He was showing up everywhere. There were so many sightings reported in Skamania County, Washington, that they passed an ordinance for his protection. To this day, if you harm a Bigfoot in Skamania County, you can face a fine of up to $1,000 for even a year in jail. How are they going to prove that? Well, if you shoot a Bigfoot. How are you going to prove that I did that? Because then you would video it. No one's sure. ever seen the Bigfoot. Well, I mean, they've seen it, but they ain't got to. Well, there's a Bigfoot and I shot it. The only shooting allowed is with a camera, which nearly every person in the country has on them at all times. So I'm waiting. And we've, we've got some pictures we're going to talk about. Okay. Here's a photo of another alleged Bigfoot print. This was taken in Johnstown, Pennsylvania in 1980, and the print measures 17.75 inches. Residents at the time also reported hearing unusual noises and odors in the area. Ah. Uh, what do you think about that one? Layla, Toes look a little Layla weird. might have been there. That's when true. you start talking about the unusual odors. Well, you can see the man's hand Okay, so and that's a matchbox. matchbook in there. Matchbook. So that you can get a comparison mm-hmm. for size. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, looks Maybe. like a looks like footprint <laughs> to me. Yeah. Could looks be big. real. But stuff like that, footprints would just be too easy to fake. I okay. Mean, well, then what do you think about this picture? This, <laughs> <laughs> this, this is this blur? <laughs> yes. This is from a video taken by a youth group leader in the Marble Mountain Wilderness in California. Jim Mills and his group spotted a strange creature in the distance, and he filmed it for several minutes. And this is one of the still frames. Okay. It well, could just I be would a man. say this is definitely conclusive evidence. <laughs> no reason to even talk about this any further. You ready to go watch some more basketball? Yes. I've got We've another couple it. games to watch. It's right here. Right there. In the, okay. The you think pixels. that one's bad? Look at this next one. Okay. Let's see the next picture. And that is a picture of a bush. Yeah. Do you see the black object in the center of the frame? I do see a bunch of shadows. Yes. <laughs> This oh, photo, conclusive evidence. This photo was taken in 1994 by Paul Freeman. Freeman was a former U.S. Forest Patrolman. He said he spotted a whole family of Bigfoots in the Blue Mountains of Washington. Would it be Bigfoots or Big Feet? That's what I'm wondering. Is it Big Feet? Mm. Well, this picture is taken from a video he shot. So, what do you think of that? I think first I think it looks of all, more like a dog. I can't <laughs> see it at all. Oh, I think your screen's of too these dark. Bright lights in front of me, and I have to say battery because that's just the kind of guy I am. Oh, you can look at so my screen. Look at yours. This right here. I don't see it. Oh, definitely 100% conclusive evidence of a shadow. <laughs> okay, this is the next one. We're moving a little closer to this day and age. Okay. This picture comes from the Utah Hills near, near Provo Canyon. A hiker snapped the photo in 2012, and the creature stood up on two legs 
and started hurling rocks in his directions. Now, this sounds like Bigfoot's MO. Okay. This. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's definitely not a bag of trash. <laughs> it does look like a bag it's of trash. 100% not a big trash bag <laughs> full of leaves. <laughs> Okay, what about this one? Okay, next picture. Here we go. Okay, so this looks more like it might be something. That's this picture, definitely maybe a tree trunk. <laughs> it's tree trunk. This is from Mississippi in 2013. This is a still from a video captured by Josh Highcliffe on his hunting property. When he viewed the footage, he was too afraid to go back into those woods ever again. See, it's such a weird angle. It might be like the Bigfoot's face facing to the right, or that might just be a tree trunk behind another tree trunk. And the well, shadows no, he are... saw it moving. It's a video. This is just a still frame from that video. Oh. He saw it moving, and he was so freaked out, he thought somebody was playing a trick on him, and he posted the video online. But it might, online. might also be the case. Yeah, he posted a video online to see if anyone could tell him what it was. Somebody might have seen that he had a trail cam out there and did that to him intentionally. And I say that as that's probably something that's happened before. I'm sure. Maybe he isn't even in on it. They're just playing a prank on him. Bigfoot is so popular, there is a website dedicated to tracking Bigfoot sightings. If you're a fan of Bigfoot, you have to check it out. It features an interactive map with sightings categorized by color showing how recent the sightings are. It's called the Bigfoot Mapping Project, and it's really fun to explore. You can see the incredible number of reported sightings. You see the map below? Okay, let me pull that up. That is definitely quite the heat map there, isn't it? Of course, some of them are just people making stuff up, but a lot of them are quite interesting, and I've chosen some of them for us to talk about. You can see the yellow, the bright orange-yellow color. Yes. That's the most recent. Okay. So we're going to start with one from May 1st of 2022. I was in my backyard playing with my dogs and my wife was planting the garden and I hear inhuman light -like noises. I see something in the woods staring at my dog. I start yelling, trying to scare it off. And my wife runs inside with my dog and it moves a little and you can see it has breasts, but it's extremely hairy. I threw a small rock at it, threw a small rock at me. And ran away, and that's from Missouri. I didn't notice what color it was. <laughs> no. I didn't notice, you know, anything else about the creature, but I did. It was did. hairy, and it had breasts. I did notice. <laughs> okay, so you want to read the next one? It is from August 18th, 2017, from North Carolina. Oh, I, I tried to get a bunch of different one. states. Yes, there we go. Give me the North Carolina mm -hmm. one. Okay, I'll read it like I'm from North Carolina, which conveniently, I am. My wife and I were standing outside of my truck. We were watching lightning. I walked across a small two-lane road to a canal to see if I could catch gator eye shine with my flashlight. That's so North Carolina. When I heard something walking in the swamp maybe 50 yards back into the trees, I got spooked and booked it back across the road to see where my wife was. I had just started to tell her what was going on when this thing let out the most terrifying, loudest roar I have ever heard. You know how people in the Bigfoot world refer to the T-Rex roar? Well, that's, this was that. <laughs> the thing that struck me the most was how I could feel it in my chest when this thing let loose. Something about the roar was ape-like. I can't really put my finger on it. Another thing that was weird was my wife's reaction. She's a diehard skeptic of anything paranormal. First words out of her mouth was, Bigfoot. We jumped in the truck and pulled off. I shined the flashlight into the woods, but didn't see or hear anything further. There's Yeehaw. more. Oh, wait, there's more. Uh, there's more. All right. Sorry. The roar lasted maybe five seconds. Something else I noticed was how silent the swamp was when I walked across that road to the canal. Normally, when it's hot out like that, it's loud with the various nocturnal creatures. Something else I noticed when I peeled out of there and... <laughs> Turned down Wooded Acre Drive, about two blocks down there, is a house. And then there were, I believe, 11 deer standing <laughs> in their front yard. I drove within a few feet of them, and they didn't move. They honestly looked spooked. Now, you know he's probably looking for his bow oh, yeah. or his gun in his the gun. back when he saw that. Even though there's a big foot, he's <laughs> yeah. ready to hunt. One other thing that happened, I believe it was the summer before, not sure of the date, my wife and I had just started going out. Lake Waccamaw was a place I grew up going to my whole life, fishing, hunting, etc. It's an outdoorsman's paradise. Well, we were driving down Canal Cove Road farther up where I would later hear the roar. I was driving along the canal and 
had my flashlight trying to see gators. That's something I would do. My light ended up catching a set of eyes back in the swamp, probably a good eight to ten feet up. They were next to a pretty large tree, probably 25, 50 feet back into the swamp. Then they were pretty large and reddish. I just kind of wrote them off as being an owl or a raccoon, not really thinking about Bigfoot until the roar happened the next year. Who knows? <laughs> so what do you think about this guy? What oh, do you think about uh, Bubba's account? 100%. Yeah, this guy is, he is not going to lie about it because he recounted in detail the 11 deer. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sort of surprised he didn't indicate the presence of... Uh, Breasts. Yeah. <laughs> it must have been a male. Yeah, that's why there is no interest there, I guess. Okay, this one happened March 18th, 2021 in Georgia. I'd been living on 32 acres for a few months and spent a lot of time outside and in the pool. A few times when we were swimming, we had rocks thrown at the fence surrounding the pool or on the roof of the pool house. Other times I would feel as if someone was watching me or see strange shadows in the woods that would disappear. Until the day I saw the creature that changed my life forever. He crossed in front of a clearing about 10 feet wide in a second. It was so fast that I couldn't comprehend what I had just seen. I stood there frozen with shock for at least 15 minutes before getting my phone to call my husband at work at Fort Gordon on a recorded line to tell him I had just seen Bigfoot on our property. When he got home that evening, we walked the property to determine the creature's height. We found prints, tree structures, a place in tall grass which looked like a bed, and even what appeared to be a filtration system made with twigs into our stream. We even found cans with strings between them that we theorized they used them <laughs> a for communication purposes. The thing that stood out the most to me wasn't this creature's massive size. It was the hair. It was black as ink and moved like hair underwater. I took pictures and a video of tall grasses, which looked like they had been matted down into a bed by a large creature. This is a common theme that people will see these kind of um, branches put together like this. Okay, that's like a Blair Witch situation. Yeah, that's just, that's that kind of situation. Okay, so that's where that story ends. Well, you can see the pictures. Well, she's talking about the hair. Why didn't she keep some of the hair and go get it DNA tested? She didn't get any hair. She saw it moving on the creature. Oh, wonder why it didn't leave any hair in its bed. I mean, you leave all <laughs> kinds of hair in the bed. I do. Next one is from Mississippi. <laughs> July 20th, 1991. So we're going back a little while. Here's okay, your, Mississippi. Ahead. We were riding the back roads of hot coffee on Okahay Creek Road and heard a scream that was a mix between a lion, a bear, and a man. It wasn't any animal that I've encountered in South Mississippi. Conclusively, Bigfoot, I say. Uh, nothing else would fit the bill. <laughs> so sometimes people submit their stories at a later date, but they're talking about an older date. So they submitted this one in June of 2023, but it's about an encounter they had in 1988. They finally built up the ability to talk about it. In Florida, they're finally okay with speaking out. Okay. In June 1988, my family was spending the week at Camp Blanding. My brother and I drove around the base looking for deer, even though it was mid-afternoon. While driving down Dade Road, we saw an animal in the swale ditch next to the forest. It was around 20 to 25 feet from us and squatted down. It was small with reddish-orange fur and black rings around its eyes. It was covered in fur had a flat face and a flat nose. It was easily visible for 45 seconds to a minute, didn't move, just looked at us. We couldn't understand what it was. Our first thought was maybe some kind of hybrid animal escaped from a fenced-in area we had passed. Like big government? I can't speak to that. There was a noise in the woods behind us, and the bushes moved, and it stood up and turned around and jumped into the bushes directly behind it. It was three and a half to four feet tall. Bigfoot. <laughs> Once it disappeared into the thick Florida underbrush, we heard a deep growling sound that left the area quickly. Later, I thought possibly a young skunk ape, but had never seen any animal like it. So maybe, maybe it's, it's a baby. Mini foot. It's a baby Bigfoot. Baby Bigfoot. Rah! Ah, baby Bigfoot oh, would be so baby cute. Baby Bigfoot, you smell of stench. <laughs> you should make me a baby Bigfoot shirt. There we go, baby Bigfoot. This next one is from April 15th, 2007, Washington. In spring of 2007, I went for a hike up in Dry Creek, just west of Port Angeles. I parked at the gate at Walkabout Road, hiked my dog up to the mountain for a few miles that day for no particular reason. I heard there were MTB trails up there, so I wanted to see them. 
On the way back down, I stopped at an intersection where the road crosses a power line road. I remember looking across the strait at the pre-evening lights of Victoria, B.C. That's when I looked to the west and saw what I thought was a bear walking up a power line road away from me. We were about 200 yards apart or less, but I could see it was on two hind legs walking upright. Then I thought it was maybe someone playing paintball and they had a ghillie suit on. It walked more and reached the crest of the road where it turned around and just stood looking at me. The entire body was black, but the face was a lighter gray color. Where it stood was right next to the power pole, which had support, horizontal support stringers. Its head was level with the support stringer. I waved my arms and said hi, <laughs> thinking it might still be a person, but it just stood there motionless. <laughs> hey, you're 27 feet tall. <laughs> Couldn't possibly be something to worry about. After a minute, it turned around and was gone. I waited about 10 minutes and decided I had to walk over and look for tracks, try to make sense of what had happened. The bottom of the road had some horse tracks, and then it turned to compacted gravel. When I reached the pole, I had to reach up to grab the stringer board. I'm six feet tall, and its head was easily eight feet. <laughs> That's when I knew for sure it wasn't a person. I got scared and left ASAP. This was in 2007, so my Motorola Razor wasn't worth Excuses. even trying to capture a picture, unfortunately. I was active duty Coast Guard at the time and not under the influence of anything. <laughs> sure in case you, you were asking, Coast Guard. <laughs> Answered all of my questions. Coast why Guard. no picture and why were you drinking? Motorola Razor. <laughs> I had one it of all. those. I had one of those. They were pretty. Yeah, had had the a pink, pink one. one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. August 20th, 2023. This is more recent. Idaho. Me and a buddy were on a backcountry adventure motorcycle trip through Idaho, camping along the way. We decided last minute to stay at a place called Deadwood Outfitters. It was a small ranch with a few cabins, guided hunting and horseback riding trips. Typically, we could camp, but it was pouring rain. They had a cabin available for us, and the lady checked us in. Nobody else was on the ranch at the time besides her and us at 5 p.m. We were hanging all of our wet gear out on the porch railings when we started hearing this loud, yelling, screaming noise coming from the woods. At first, we thought it might be guests out riding horses, but after about the fifth repeat of the scream, it was clearly not human. It was so loud. It was a loud yell that would end with a growl scream, and there were several of these creatures doing this at the same time. When the owners came back with the group on horses, we asked them if it was them or if they heard it, and they said no to both. Indescribable. <laughs> Indescribable. It just ends with an exclamation. When we were asking the owner if she heard anything like that before, she said earlier that morning while her husband was out helping a guest look for their lost dog at the reservoir, she heard the same thing in the woods and couldn't explain what it was either. What's interesting is there was a huge burn area on three sides of this 300-acre property, and it's our best guess that something was forced into the new area because of it. Truly blessed to have had the likely once-in-a-lifetime encounter. Yeah. Hashtag, <laughs> Hashtag blessed. blessed. <laughs> I didn't get eaten. Yeah, so I'm very true. thankful. You know. I wonder if it sounded anything like our little um toy, toy over there. I mean tool. Our tool. Not We're gonna toy. use that as an investigator. I wonder if it attracts ghosts too. I don't know. I don't think we need help with that. We seem to have been very fortunately blessed with ghosts. <laughs> Hashtag lately. blessed. Yeah. So this next story is from Florida. It's from May fourth, two thousand five, and it occurred or was written at eleven AM. I was in the J.W. Corbett WMA looking for deer sheds and areas to hunt for the next deer season. I had gone a few miles down a gravel road when I saw a trail and decided to pull over and start hiking. I went down this trail for about a mile when I saw a small berm about four to five feet high. I climbed to the top to get a better view of the area. Behind the berm was a well-used game trail, so I decided to follow it to see where it went. I followed it for about a quarter mile where it ended at an open area of Palmetto. The area was only about 100 yards across, so I started crossing it. As I was walking, I was mostly looking down, looking for deer tracks. I got about halfway across when all of a sudden there was the loudest, deepest yell I have ever heard. I actually felt it in my chest. It scared me so bad that I immediately turned around and started walking out of the area. I had never been so scared in my life. 
All I could do was tell myself not to run, just keep walking. As I was continuing to walk out, I could hear what sounded like heavy footprints. Reminded me of heavy sandbags hitting the ground. I heard these steps from my left and right. I continued to be as casual as I could walking out. I didn't even take the trail back. I just made a straight line back through the forest towards the road. Once I got back to the road, I could see my truck about 500 yards away. That's when I started to run. Once I got in my truck, I got out of there as quickly as I could. The yell has stuck with me ever since. I can only describe it as sitting in a theater with the surround sound turned all the way up and blasting King Kong yell. I hope I never hear that sound again. wonder why he's so loud. Because he hungry. <laughs> so what is he hungry for? We have not determined that yet. Yeah, I can't find any evidence other than the one saying that he likes to eat fish. Okay, so the bumper sticker was lying to you ever since the beginning. Yeah, because a lot of people say that he steals food from their camps and things like that. Then he throws rocks at him because he's a punk. On May 5th, 1995, Illinois. I've never told this outside of a few close friends. I'm originally from southern Indiana, and this took place at Potoka Lake, south of Indianapolis. This happened in the spring of 1995. I believe it was early May. My best friend, AJ, my brother, Scott, and I all went fishing in AJ's bass boat. We fished all over the lake, and about 2 a.m., we began to make our way back to the boat ramp because it was becoming increasingly foggy. As we got near the ramp, the fog became so dense, you couldn't see beyond about two feet in front of you. It was like an impenetrable wall. We had to cut the main engine and switch to the trolling motor. For those of you who don't know what that is, it's a small electric motor on the bow of the boat it allows you to silently move the boat with great precision, but it isn't very powerful at all. It was very slow going. Around 3.30 a.m., we decided to stop for a while because we knew we were within proximity of the cove where the boat ramp was, but we were a bit disoriented. We hoped for the fog to clear a little. We dropped the anchor and began to fish and talk quietly among ourselves. Now, this boat ramp is in a heavily forested area. You have to take a country back road to even find it. It is quite isolated, and the whole area is bordered by the Hoosier National Forest. We believed we were about in the middle of the cove, so that would have put the shoreline roughly 100 feet from us. There is no bank to speak of, as the opposite side of the cove from the boat ramp is a finger of land that juts out into the lake. It's approximately 30 feet higher than the lake level and had steep shell cliffs that dropped nearly straight down to the water. As we sat quietly fishing, there was suddenly a sound unlike anything I have heard anywhere on this earth. Now, we'd grown up hearing stories about Bigfoot-type creatures that occurred in our area as far back as 1958, but I was not prepared for what I heard that morning. The only way I can describe it was an extremely fierce, primitive, primitive guttural roar that absolutely tore through the fog. I have a lump in my throat typing this and remembering it. If you have ever been to the zoo and heard a lion truly roar, that was near the equivalent of this. I grew up in the hills, caves, and woods of southern Indiana day and night all seasons, I've never heard anything like it. I actually felt it deep in my body. It was primal, it was visceral, and it was very close to us. It sounded like it came up from the finger of land opposite the boat ramp. I can say that this was the first time in my life I felt absolute terror. I mean, like, can you imagine how a mouse feels as it tries to escape a cat? A primal reptilian brain. Fight or flight terror. I was frozen in my seat, as were AJ and Scott. We sat stock still as the roar echoed off the hills around us. We had no idea if this creature, which I know in my heart was a Sasquatch, was capable of reaching us in the cove. We were only about in about seven feet of water, according to the fish finder. With this roar di just dying away, I whispered, what was that? AJ didn't answer. He sat immobile at the front of the boat on his pedestal seat. Scott was in the seat behind the steering wheel up to on his knees, straining to look into the fog. I don't know, he said. I've never heard anything like it in my life. I agreed with that sentiment. That actually caused me more concern because my brother was an experienced hunter who had hunted about every wild animal around one time or another. I was sitting behind him on the rear pedestal seat. I was actually shaking with fear. AJ whispered, what do we do? I said, let's get out of here. We hauled in the anchors as fast as we could. AJ turned on the trolling motor and started going just as fast as we could to the boat ramp. We could finally see the lights of the boat ramp and parking lot. We realized that one of us was going to have to get out of the boat and run up the ramp to the parking lot, which is about 200 yards away. We saw the dock come into view as the fog was beginning to lift slightly. 
We stopped about 30 feet from the dock and sat for about 10 minutes listening and watching. AJ then pulled over to the dock. We tied up to the dock and AJ hopped out, ran up the hill to the truck and pulled it and the trailer down. They loaded it while I stood guard. We jumped in and took off out of there. I wonder if they had any kind of gun or anything. I thought you were going to say he ran up there, jumped in the truck and just flew away. (laughs) He's gone. I have never been back as I left the army shortly thereafter. But if I were able to go looking, I would start there. This link is the coolest I've ever found to what we've heard. So he posted a link of the sound, something similar to the sound they heard. Yeah. So what do you think about that? I think that's a long story. That's a lot of writing. That's what that (laughs) is. And uh, the only thing I I can take away from that is that he used a trolling motor. And we all know that Bigfoots hate trolling motors. Well, they So I'm thinking that was the problem. Like the small whirring sound of the motor drew its attention. And they're lucky to have survived. They really are. is, Is my takeaway. This one is from June 12th, 2023 in Washington. My family has been going to the Salmon Creek area for years. We have our favorite spots to play in the creek and let our dogs run. It had been a rainy spring. It was after the rain stopped and the creek water level dropped. Our daughters, 15 and 20, were off exploring the river looking for logging camp artifacts in the river rock. They came back to us very excited. They needed a phone camera to take pictures of the footprints they found. Okay, so this must have happened before 2023. They're just posting it because they need a camera. You know, everybody's got Every one. kid's got a yeah. cell phone at this point. We did not go with them because why would we? <laughs> no, just go off into the woods. It's fine. As we were cleaning up to go home. Now, as we live in Bigfoot <laughs> country, we don't doubt the existence of our fuzzy cousins, and apparently they're not concerned about them either. Mm-mm. But to actually see the footprints was amazing. We figured the prints were made in the mud soon after the creek water level went down. They were untouched for weeks as the grass grew into the prints. The pictures are not that good. We are now better prepared. In this area, we have often heard knockings that were out of place. So they're not even... I'm not even going to try to take a good well, picture. It's, it's sort of like you have the ocean near your house. Like, I've seen the ocean before, and if it's like all of a sudden one day there's a massive tidal wave coming, you'll be like, well, we've heard about these things. <laughs> I'm not going to take a picture coming. of it or anything. Okay, this one has a picture. June 15th, 2021, Oregon. Went to retrieve game cam card in my habituation area and caught the Bigfoot leaving the site. Good <laughs> grief, it all looks it- just like a big white circle. <laughs> Do you see it? I see right there. It. I see it. I see a uh, whale. It's either a Bigfoot or it's. Oh, what is it? Or it's like a large man wearing a black jacket. <laughs> I don't know. It's kind of compelling. It's very compelling. He All should right. have brought his trolling motor with him. Then he could have really found out for sure. Well, let's go back to Oregon, yeah. 1991. Okay. Lobster Valley. We were looking for a creature that had run across the road in front of a friend's car, scaring them. They saw it. We went looking to prove they were full of crap. (laughs) After 30 minutes walking along this desolate, dark, and very quiet road, we heard a few crashing footsteps below us in a lower area of the valley, only 50 feet or so off the road and 15 feet below us. The area was thick with blackberry brambles. I then smelled a... Pungent, musky urine scent. That's him. I likened it to that smell when you find fresh bull elk sign that tell, tell, fresh, pissy scent. (laughs) When we stopped walking and making noise, it stops moving. And when we make noise or move away, it would move with us. This wasn't deer or elk or a bear. We were being stalked by a predator that was willing to risk staying close even when it couldn't be stealthy. The fear crept in, and we started moving faster on the roadway, and after a bit, the sound fell off and moved further away into the valley, toward the creek, until it went quiet. Imagine, that was pretty scary. Not as scary as trying to read this horrible grammar here. It's like like I'm having to translate as I read. It's like some of these things were not written with spell check turned on. Okay, this is California, 2017. My kids and I were just going to bed after watching the news on TV, and we all heard a loud growl screeching. It echoed through the canyons, and we all got scared. And then my son's social media started going off about how many people were also hearing the yelling 
and we all tried to question what it was. I've lived here since 1999. I'm familiar with every animal sound, but this was something else. I bet it was his dad. Like <laughs> stretching. And the whole, you know like, how loud the whole a dad is when it? they stretch. Well, you are loud, but it doesn't sound I'm like so a big I'm so loud, trick. like the house shakes when I'm... That's Layla. Well, she's, you know, she's sweet. June 2022, Nevada. I'd been using CE5 protocol to try and contact Sasquatch entities <laughs> for a while. Since we don't know if these beings are entirely physical or traverse using portals or what. I don't live near forests or hot spots, so this method of using meditation and intent was best for me. I was laying down with the focus on intent to contact a Sasquatch, remaining fully open to the experience, and I fell asleep slash astral <laughs> projected. Okay, this guy's very reliable. I don't see why you wouldn't believe it. In this non-physical state, I suddenly saw two large eyes peering through the bottom edge of my window, which is about seven feet from the ground. The dark irises were so wide I could barely see the white edges of them. The face freaked me out, very dark skin, wrinkly and flattened a lot like an orangutan. But at this point, I hid in the hallway away from my window because of my shocked reaction to the appearance of the creature. I regret my reaction to this day. But I didn't know what to expect. I waited until the creature stopped peering through my window. Keeping a distance, I went outside the edge of my house to find the large creature seemingly moping on a stump next to our woodpile. It was ignoring me, so I had a chance to study its full body appearance. The fur covering its head was cinnamon and dark brown, very matted, almost like dreadlocks. But it also wore a large poncho from the skin of a large <laughs> animal, which surprised me because I didn't think Sasquatch wear clothing. With caution, I rounded behind the creature, and it was still completely ignoring me, so I bumped him on the back. He drummed like a barrel, yet didn't react. Feeling like I'd messed up, I went back to my physical body Okay, so they're doing up. this in a... The metaphysical world, of okay. course. Come on, get with the times. Okay, so... There okay. were no signs of this creature in my waking state, nor can I believe there was actual contact. I regret my harsh reaction to the entity, since I was the only one who called it in the first place. I really didn't know what to expect, and there was no hostility, just pure rejection. I've since stopped trying this method again, because I'm not sure how this supports <laughs> anything as evidence or contact with these beings. Our modern society and the world of these creatures just can't coalesce unless we have a specific goal. Otherwise, I'm just going to leave them alone. Okay. And that's where that ends. But I feel like the next <laughs> sentence would have been, and I can't afford mushrooms anymore. <laughs> oh, my gosh. That was something. That was a that so was definitely a story. Astral projection. Uh, and uh, See Bigfoot. That's what you want to do is see Bigfoot. I tapped him on the back. He's I'm a good guy. He's otherwise. wearing a poncho, though. He's a good guy. You I've probably see him at a before. bar, you know, maybe playing some music in a bar. Oh, well, I'm surprised we haven't seen him in Ty on Tybee. Yeah. Okay, this is in August of 2005, New York. I grew up in Wingdale. I was born in the year 2000 and had lived in Wingdale for half my childhood and was very aware of Bigfoot. I always heard the howls and low growls or high pitched guttural sounds in the night. I'd hear wood knocking on trees that would usually be even more active in the summertime. I once remember being outside on a muggy summer night. I was maybe eight or nine years old. I felt like I was being watched. It was nighttime, and I was outside with my neighbor's kids, who were maybe three or four at the time. We were knocking while we were coloring out on the porch at 8 or 9 p.m. Then I heard a loud, guttural yell. I was certain of what I heard, and to this day, I know it was a male Bigfoot. How do you know that? I don't know. Maybe it was the lack of prominent breasts. <laughs> she just heard it. She didn't see it. You don't know. You don't know. Sometimes that's the only thing you take from the experience, apparently. The breasts. <laughs> well, the men apparently do. And this one's in Canada, near Ottawa. Okay. While staying at a cabin on White Lake for a week in the summer of 1967, one morning my sister and I decided to walk up to the entry road to the cabin marina area in the north part of the lake. As we walked a few hundred yards up the road, we saw a large black animal standing by the road close to the forest. It was large, maybe seven to eight feet tall, standing upright and facing us. It was not moving, and we looked at it, and it looked at us at a distance of approximately 70 yards for maybe five minutes. 
Concerned, we decided to return to the cabin area. I was 12 and my sister was 10, but we were very experienced with bears, having spent much time and seeing many previously on trips to the Smoky Mountains and elsewhere in the U.S. We were, and are to this day, convinced this was not a bear. I have from a very young age spent much time in the forests of the American East. I now live part-time in a mountainous region near George Washington National Forest. I have seen many bears at a distance and up close for about 62 years now. My sister and I didn't talk about this episode for a long time, but a few years ago I brought up the subject and she and I recounted the story and we agreed, quote, that was no bear. Which reminded me of what we said in 1967. So my thing is like people act like they're so familiar with bears or whatever. How familiar do you really need to be to know what a bear looks like? I feel like I've if, seen you've a seen, bear before. if you've seen a bear once or twice, you've kind of got the idea of what a bear looks like. I've seen a polar bear at the Shield Museum in Gaston County. Well, we saw them at the Columbia Zoo too. Yeah, but I saw one up close. It's well, we like a it skeleton alive. or it's a stuffed one or... And you could see how tall it is compared to humans. And it like it would be taller than the ceiling in here, I think, if it stood up. On doing all this, I've come to realize I'm never going to have an encounter with Bigfoot because I would never be in the woods. So you're going to be fine. I would, but I wanted to see it. Well, then you're just going to have to make some sacrifices. I mean, I don't go camping. Well, you've I would got never the call go hunting. right here. I mean, uh, Is obviously. there a place you can go, like, glamping? I could do that. That sounds kind of <laughs> not my style. <laughs> Well, you don't camp either anymore. That's just because no one wants to. It might be too much for you these days. I don't know. You were young when we used to do that. I'm lighter now than I used to be. Been losing weight on that keto. This one, we're going to go all the way to Bangladesh. Uh Aha. 410 2023. I was visiting Bangladesh for a month from the UK. Me and my cousin, Alaman, went on a motorbike ride when we saw a human like creature running, very tall, and it had a really fishy smell. This was outside of the city, Silet. We froze and panicked as we didn't know what it was, but it looked like a human, but with long arms and very wide shoulders. I reached for my phone from my pocket to see if I could record it as it was running away, but my cousin said no. He was scared of it and it start if it starts to come at us. We then quickly turned around as fast as we could. I still would have taken the picture. Yeah. We Come didn't on, might tell, have been the last thing you did. We didn't tell anyone about the incident. This is the first time I'm writing this. I'm still thinking about this every day, trying to convince myself that it was just a person. But the height, size, and the smell is what really The height, me. the size, <laughs> the color, the same wheelbase. <laughs> Did they even both come in metallic mint green paint? They were. <laughs> What's the point? <laughs> so the next story is Northern Michigan, right? Mm-hmm. A heavily wooded property off State Street, just barely within the city limits. Between January and April 2023, my camera was offline. When I had a chance to reset it, there was a small structure in direct center view of the camera and a new game trail that had been created and used by, obviously, larger animals. I am unsure of the exact day slash month it was created, but it had been there at least for a few weeks. The nearest neighbor is about five acres over and doesn't have any structures on his property or any reason to travel through my property. The area has a couple other reports nearby, and I thought I should at least add it to the collection. No footprints were seen or found, as spring thaw may have washed them away. I have two seasonal ponds and deer roaming the property, too. Last year, something left a deer carcass spread all over the property, which, again, could be anything. But now that the structure has appeared, could indicate some activity or a travel corridor as Lake Huron is close by. The property is a heavily wooded 20 acres and sits against others that haven't been cleared out either. I saw there were some other reports in the area. As an enthusiast, I thought it should be at least considered in adding to the map as a possibility. Perhaps I've stumbled upon a small travel corridor. Lake Huron shoreline is just across State Street, U.S. 23. So see, this is another similar structure to... The Blair Witch. Yeah. Yeah, like they're building some sort of bed or something. Apparently, they're all witches, which makes sense because they're all ghosts. Okay, this one is from March 20th, 2024. So this is just the other day. 
I was walking on my morning walk before my 8 a.m. class when I spotted some movement across the swamp and heard some whooping and branches breaking, stopping shortly after. After a movement, of, a moment of silence, well, it says movement, I spotted the beast eating a beaver, making eye contact. I whooped back at him, causing him to startle and throw the carcass in my direction. You I, took the beaver. I thought I made it up until I went back later in the day and the carcass was still there. Additional comments, too. <laughs> Poop in my pants for real. <laughs> Color cinnamon. <laughs> Is he talking one. about the Bigfoot or the, or the <laughs> unclear? <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, this next one is my favorite. Like, oh my describe gosh. describe your encounter on the Cleveland Brown sidelines, and that's it. That's it. <laughs> that's all it and is. And then the only other piece of description is their color brown. <laughs> so we can pretty much assure, assure this is a uh, this is a truthful one. Yeah. yeah, he likes the Browns. Apparently, who would have known? But maybe he was a fan of the opposing team. We don't know these things. This is just a small sampling of encounters reported by believers. I've read and listened to tons and tons and tons of them. I couldn't find any examples of encounters in the Savannah area, but we did talk to a guy in the bar, surprise, surprise, who did have an experience in middle Georgia. Yeah. You remember Jody? And he's invited us to stay at his place. I don't know if you remember that, but I said, no, thank you. He probably doesn't remember that because he he didn't remember telling us the story the next day. Yeah, but he does remember now and he knows my name and he he likes us and we see him out there a lot. He's one of these people that came to visit Tybee back in August and he's never left. Just decided he lives here now, which is great. He fits right in. Yeah, he's a a cool guy. So Mm -hmm. I'm I'm, I'm a big fan of him. So So what was his story? We well, came up, we both been drinking, and uh, he just, uh, for some random reason, started telling me about you how asked him. he had an experience with Bigfoot. No, he said something that led to it. But well, I think you were talking about ghosts and stuff, and then you're like, yeah, we're oh, Bigfoot. Oh, yeah, we were talking about ghosts in the bar, and then he mm-hmm. brought that up, mm-hmm. I think, because he was drunk. Mm-hmm. And I said, no, I, in fact, have not. And he told us a story saying that he he's a... He's older than us, and he has experience with hunting and trapping and stuff. You know, he's got property, big property in in the backwoods like of Georgia. And acres. So he he's very familiar with animals. He's familiar with their calls. He's familiar with uh, hunting animals. So he knows what he hears out on his property. He knows what should be on his property yeah. too. And he said he was staying there one night by himself. He's in, in a, a camper. Yeah, in a camper. And it was just him out there. I don't remember if he said he had a dog or not. He may have. And he said that he heard something out there that was a call that he was not familiar with and had not heard before. And it scared him. And like I said, he's like, he started to name off all the animals that are out in that territory and how he knows their sounds and their calls. So whatever it is, is not something that a normal creature would make. But then he said he, uh, actually got scared to the point where he got in the camper. Then this creature came and was trying to get him in the camper and actually scratched the side of the camper and may have been rocking it or pushing it, trying to get him in out of there. He did not come out obviously and survived this to tell the tale came out, said he had big claw marks on the side of the camper. I'm like, I don't remember if he told us when this happened or what year it was, or if it was recent, I like, think it was a while, a while ago. Yeah, I don't know why I didn't get pictures, but, you know, if that happened to me and I was alone in the woods, maybe that might not be my first concern. Yeah, but the next day I would take pictures. Well, the next day I'd take pictures of the evidence, mm-hmm. but I would assume he'd be able to show it. Maybe we should ask him about yeah, that. Yeah, let's ask him again. Get more detail on the story. It's been a little bit since we heard it, but, you know, he's invited us to go out and stay in that part of the woods to which I politely declined. I would do it. Only if you glamp. Yeah, I could make it a glamping Which situation. And if it's a camper, it. I assume it has like running water. I would not think so. Oh, but I don't know. Campers have running water? I don't know. I haven't been in a camper. I've only <laughs> like, uh, you know, done that camping where you just have a pup tent and you don't have don't any know. amenities at all. Yeah, I don't do that anymore. I can't remember what that's even called. It's been so long since I did it. But it's that's called the only, roughing it. You know, and I'm not that kind of guy. That's the only kind of camping I'm familiar with so the reason i believe his story is i know he was drinking when he said it but he's not the type of person that seems like they would just make stuff up because the next day when you 
he walked in and you're like, yeah, hey, I didn't Bigfoot. Remember like, hey, Bigfoot. Because we gave him a, he gave himself a nickname, apparently. Yeah. And he's like, what? He did not remember telling you. He's like, I've never told anyone that story. So Yeah. So I, he didn't intend to tell us. Yeah. So I think he's probably really did have an experience with Bigfoot, if such a thing exists. So after all this evidence, do you think that he's real? Is there I, really a Bigfoot? I think that there's definitely something. I think that there's far too many reports of sightings, things being found. A lot of people that, I mean, there's guys like the guy that makes the costume. who's clearly probably just trying to cash in on something and, and other people who are trying to get either money or their fame. But then on the other hand, there are just as many people who have nothing to gain out of lying about this and actually may have something to lose for lying mm-hmm. about it because then you, in some people's eyes would lose credibility or people might think you're crazy. So I can't think that every one of these people are wrong. So I'm not saying that there's a Bigfoot in the sense that everyone thinks Bigfoot ought to be Bigfoot. But what I'm saying is I do believe there is something out there that may be Bigfoot like this, but that is unexplainable and is definitely not natural. Do you think he's vegan? I, there may be vegan ones. I don't know. It may not even eat food. These things may be spiritual beings. Oh, they may be like you have to astral project. Have you ever been it. on an astral, astrophysical plane? No. You Can't ever, say that you ever eaten mushrooms and honey uh, no, before? I have not. You know? Well, then how would you know? I don't. That's why I want to go glamping. So, do you think Bigfoot's real? I think there's something out there for sure. I don't know exactly what it is, but I, I, there's a million podcasts about people telling their stories. And there's all over the internet. Like, I just don't think, I mean, clearly some of these people are just making stuff up to be funny. Yeah. But I don't think that the massive amounts of people could be all, all like, wrong. wrong. There's just too much evidence yeah, so for there to not be something. any of our listeners have had an experience with Bigfoot, please let us know. We'd love to hear it. And if you would like to share it and you'd like it to be on the air, we we would share it. And uh, unless it deals with the astral, physical plane or perhaps the Cleveland Brown sidelines, <laughs> yeah. uh, we'll, we'll talk about it. So that's going to take us to the portion of the show where we insert graphic here. Excellent. What? Oops. <laughs> We're watching. Watching. Sorry, I've done a lot of talking. <laughs> you have done quite a bit of talking on this episode. We're already over an hour. And I, I think know. I've said like three sentences. Uh-uh, I'll let you read some stories. You did indeed. So, what did we watch recently? This, um, well, <laughs> what had happened was we planned to do this episode a long time ago. So, this was last year when we watched this movie, and it is the 1972. I think it's like a pseudo documentary sort of documentary. Yes. The Legend of Boggy Creek. And you can read this description from Wikipedia on what the plot exactly is. Because you can't remember, can you? I remember it. Okay. But for the you sake don't. of our listeners, I'll read you the plot summary from Wikipedia. I'm refreshing my memory here. The film claims to be a true story detailing the existence of the folk monster, a seven-foot-tall Bigfoot-like creature that has reportedly been seen by residents of a small Arkansas community since the 1940s. It is described as being completely covered in reddish-brown hair, leaving three-toed tracks, and having a foul odor. Does it have breasts? Unclear. Several locals from the small town of Folk, Arkansas, recall their stories claiming that the creature has killed many large animals over the years. Yeah, it was a lot. Yeah, there's definitely was a a lot of good stories in there, and it was definitely shot in them real good 1970s style of film. Yeah, it's very 1970s, and I forgot that it was in Arkansas, which is cool. I wonder if they know about the mustard mustard and the mayo. mayo, (laughs) I can see them both, in case you're wondering. So what did you think about this? This is basically a documentary. You're getting to see them talk to people, and they reenact a lot of the scenes that happen. A lot of them are kind of laughable by today's standards, but the stories themselves are attested to be true. So what do you think about this movie, and what would you give it on a rate of 1 to 12 dog treats? I'd probably give it an 8, I'm guessing, because it's like I, I like it for the nostalgia, I guess. 
I like old movies. And it talked about the folk monster, which was Bigfoot, maybe. Maybe. I, I, there had to be something going on there for all these people to have similar stories, I think. Yeah. I mean, I think if you are into Bigfoot, this is like a classic. People say you have to watch this movie if you watch anything about Bigfoot. So it's worth watching once. It's not something I would like want to watch again. <laughs> but I would recommend watching it once if you're into Bigfoot. And if you're into Bigfoot, you've probably already seen it. But if you haven't, I would say watch it. I'm going to give it a 7 out of 12 myself. Um, it was it was interesting-ish. But it's a documentary in the sense like you'd see a documentary back when you're in elementary school yeah, or junior high. If you were feel? our age. Mm-hmm. I don't know what they show now. <laughs> But it seemed like YouTube. something that they would pull the projector out, like the screen, and project it at the screen and show you for people that remember that thing. If I remember correctly, like the intro was like five minutes long. It was just like panning over a lake or something and yeah, music. Yeah, credits or something. Yeah. And you're like, we're setting the scene yeah. by just putting the camera in run mode and everyone's running down to the diner so to I get breakfast. So I forward that part. Yeah, but other than that, 7 of 12, I liked it. it the subject matter is pretty good, but... I feel like it could stand with some updating today. Yeah. I wonder if there's Perhaps. a Bigfoot horror movie out there. Probably. We should try to find one of those. You look into that. Like a campy one from can Shudder? <laughs> it will probably involve Christmas, too, for some reason. <laughs> it just seems like a very Christmas theme. Yeah. yeah. I think I would like that. So that's going to bring us to the portion of our episode that we like to call... Layla, Layla and, and coffee, coffee talk. talk. So Layla has been scared of the wind all day. It's winding out here, as we say. As you say. As I say. I just stare at you funnily when you say it. <laughs> so she went and put herself to bed. She was so scared. Not just a normal bed. She put herself in the middle of the house where she can't hear the wind and lay down. Yeah, it was so cute. And coffee, she's not been herself lately. She's had a injury of yeah, some sort. She's been feeling a little sickly, it seems. I don't know if or it was painful. her leg or her side or something, but usually she's like a little live wire as soon as she gets out of her crate in the Tornado morning. Tornado in a teacup. Yeah, she bursts out of that thing and she runs and jumps and spins and bursts down the stairs and everything. And she was having trouble going down the stairs. She was like, whining whenever and she couldn't jump on our bed which is very unlike her she's usually up and down up and down up and down but we were having to pick her up and put her on the bed it was so sad yeah i mean during the week when i was working and you weren't here she would hear something outside so she'd have to jump down go run and bark at it then she'd go back into the bedroom and just sit there and whine until i walked in there and picked her up and put her on the bed oh what just a over, and over and over and over and over it's a good thing it wasn't Layla hurt because we can't pick her up. <laughs> I don't own a forklift, so I can't put you in your spot. I'm sorry. But I'm happy to report she's on the men. She's back to herself almost 100%. She jumped on the bed today by herself. She's yeah. going up and down the stairs. Spins around in the circles when she gets food. her food. Very exciting. Yeah, so I don't know. Maybe she just got hurt playing too rough with Layla. Maybe Layla grabbed her and threw her up against the wall of the house because she just got tired of her. Maybe. It's entirely possible. I mean, she's laying right in front of us right now in her producer's chair. She watches us. um, Oh, she is. I don't know if you can see her, but she is there. Does she like the sounds that that toy makes? I don't know. I didn't notice because I can't see anything past this massive bright (laughs) uh, ring light that we have here. So so if you'd like to find us online, you can go to scarysavannahandbeyond.com or you can go to any social media site and look for the user at scarysavannah. You can also hear bonus episodes and ad-free episodes if you go to our Patreon, which you can find at patreon.com forward slash Scary Savannah. Every week at a certain tier level, we do an extra episode where we talk about the upcoming week's episode and also go into detail and more personal and private things that we're doing. Random stuff. Random stuff that don't have anything to do with the (laughs) podcast. Like uh, this last week, I don't even remember what we were talking about. I think it probably involved a bar. Uh, I don't remember. Yeah, might have involved Bigfoot. I can't recall. I think the word did come up. I think it I'm did. not sure. But make sure to go do that and you can get extra content and also support the 
podcast. Go check out our store and look at the merch. You can go to our website and click on the store or merch tab up at the top. And get this shirt. This shirt she's wearing right now that we have that on the store so you can get that and uh, multiple other designs of shirts. We have all those available. Hat, uh, hat stickers, something, 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 something. That'll support Lots the podcast. If you want to help to support her coffee addiction, you can go to the website, click on the yellow coffee cup icon on the bottom left-hand side of the screen and leave a coffee. Or if you would like to leave us a review, please go do so at a five-star level. Otherwise, we are not Scary Spam and Beyond. We <laughs> are some other bother. podcasts. Go check them out. <laughs> so that's going to bring us to the portion of the show where Crystal says words and my back will stop hurting once I'm finished talking. Well, if you set up straight with your back against the chair, it might hurt. I can't hurt. help it. <laughs> I'm old. Join us next time in Savannah where the ghosts and the good times live on. But do you know who don't? Those mushrooms that our good friend Astro projected <laughs> into being so that he could meet Sasquatch who just happened to be sitting on a stump outside. With his little cloak. His cloak and his dreadlocks. So let's go have a Sasquatch cocktail. That sounds sweet. Okay, good well, times. Let's, let's have a martini no, then. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> right.